fight or flight is hardly the full story when it comes to polyvagal theory. It turns out our nervous systems have all kinds of other responses, including freeze, fawn, and flop. Plus, if you're autistic, ADHD, or if you're neurodivergent in some other way, there's a good chance polyvagal theory is going to look a little bit different for you. So what is polyvagal theory? Why is the freeze response so misunderstood? And how does neurodivergence affect polyvagal theory? Let's dive into it. Hi there, my name is Megan and this is the Neuro Curiosity Club, the only YouTube channel that I'm aware of that is specifically for people who think they might be ADHD, they might be autistic, but they're just not sure. Let's get curious about our brains together. So first, let's break down the nervous system. It's split into two parts, and then those two parts are split into more parts, and it keeps kind of going. But the main two parts of the nervous system are the central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is all of the nerves that run throughout your body. We're gonna focus on the peripheral nervous system because there is a branch of that that really is where polyvagal theory comes from, uh, which I'll explain in just a second. But first, the peripheral system is also divided into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system has two primary jobs, voluntary movement and a sensory input. As you can imagine, autism and the somatic nervous system probably go hand in hand in a lot of ways, but again, that's not really a topic for today's video. We're gonna focus much more on the autonomic nervous system, which is the second branch of the peripheral nervous system, which is part of the larger nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is further split, I promise this is the last split we're gonna talk about, further split into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic branch is all about activation. It can dilate your pupils, increase your heart rate, and pause or slow down digestion. Question. Whereas the parasympathetic branch is all about rest and it's going to do pretty much the opposite of all those things. It can constrict your pupils, slow your heart rate, and encourage digestion. So quick overview. We've got the general nervous system. It is split into the brain and spinal cord and the nerves. We're gonna focus on the nerves. When we get to the nerves, it is split to the somatic and the peripheral nervous systems. The somatic is a separate story. We're focusing on the peripheral. The peripheral is divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, and we're gonna focus on both of those today. Specifically though, we're gonna be talking about the vagus nerve, which is where the vagal in polyvagal theory comes from. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve, there are 12, and it is the longest nerve. It extends through more of the body than any other cranial nerve. And there are two main branches of the vagus nerve, the ventral branch and the dorsal branch. And the reason I'm gesturing like that, ventral generally means front, dorsal generally means back. When the ventral branch of the vagus nerve is activated, one of two things can happen. You can either have very, very slight activation, which actually leads to healthy connection, or you can have that overstimulation of the vagus nerve, which can lead to fight, flight, or freeze. When the dorsal branch of the vagus nerve is activated, that is when the parasympathetic nervous system is going to be triggered, and you're going to get responses like fawn or flop. So let's break this down. What are all of these responses? What do they actually look like in our daily lives? Let's start with healthy activation because sometimes we know what's wrong with us. We know the responses we're having that are unhelpful, but we're not totally sure what we're working toward. We don't know what healthy activation would look like. So let's define that. This could look like reaching out to others, crying, journaling, pacing, stimming in some other way, and lots of other activities that involve connecting to yourself and or connecting to others. Next up, let's talk about fight. This can look exactly the way you're thinking, screaming, throwing things, actually fighting. But this can also look like self-harm, you know, like fighting yourself. Or it could look like angry cleaning, where you're not fighting the person you're upset with or the situation causing you frustration, you're fighting a problem you know you can win, like cleaning. Next up, let's talk about flight. This is the one I tend toward the most right now in my life. This has changed over time, but right now I am in my flight mode. And this can look like literally running away. I know a couple of years ago, I was so activated that I, I got in the car and I just drove to my sister's. She lives like an hour away. And it wasn't until I got there that I realized I didn't bring the diaper bag for my kid. I didn't bring my own purse and I wasn't even wearing shoes. None of that even registered to me until I got there because I was so 
activated. But it doesn't have to look like actually running away. It could also look like panic procrastination, where you avoid the thing you know you need to be doing that's activating you and dysregulating you, and instead you procrastinate with something else, but in a totally panicked state of mind. This could also look like overbuying things. You know, you're running away from the problem and running toward dopamine that's gonna make you feel a little better for just a moment. And it could look like being hyper detailed and planning out every last thing. It's sort of like you're running away from the uncontrollable and running toward what you can control. And then we've got freeze. So you might've been a little surprised toward the beginning when I said that freeze was actually in the same camp as fight or flight. A lot of people lump freeze in with the parasympathetic response, but I disagree with that. Because what does it feel like to be frozen in fear, to be a deer in the headlights? Would you consider that activated or would you consider that dissociated, detached? For me, the deer in the headlights feeling is highly activated. Internally, there's a lot of energy. I'm just stuck. I'm just frozen and I can't do anything about that energy. The parasympathetic nervous system is not just about your actions, it's also about the way it feels in your body. And the parasympathetic nervous system, when that is activated, you don't feel huge amounts of energy and adrenaline coursing through your veins. So I don't think freeze belongs in that camp. At least in my experience, freeze has all the same activation signals as fight or flight. It just has a different behavioral response. Internally, the freeze response can look like beating yourself up, yelling at yourself, feeling like your thoughts and feelings are legitimately out of control. Whereas externally, the freeze response might look like scrolling through your phone for hours, unable to stop, or even just staring at a wall. Freeze can look like the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, but when you ask someone how they're actually feeling, that's how you know it's the sympathetic nervous system that's activated. Then we've got fawn. Fawn is a bit of a weird one to me. Um, I'm not sure if it's really sympathetic or parasympathetic. I know most uh, resources camp it with the parasympathetic, and that does make sense to me, but I also wonder if it could fit in the sympathetic. So let's talk about it. So basically the fawn response is when you do whatever you can to fawn to people who appear to have more power than you. So this might look like just agreeing, agreeing with everything the other person is saying, just yep, uh-huh, yes, I support you, yes. This could look like a really finely honed sense of humor. You're very funny and it's always used to deflect people from ever actually accessing you. Basically, the fawn response is a huge form of self-abandonment. It's not about what you want or what you need. It's about people-pleasing in a really extreme way. If you're highly activated, while you're doing all this people pleasing, you're doing the people pleasing in order to help regulate that extreme activation, it would probably fit into the sympathetic camp, right? But if you're totally shut down, totally dissociated, just agreeing to get this conversation over with so that you can go home and have a breakdown or dissociate or just go to sleep, that is probably parasympathetic. So to be honest, I'm not sure where Fawn falls. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. And then we've got flop, which is sort of a newer one. You don't always hear it when you hear discussions about fight or flight that are expanded into all these different options, but I really love flop because I think flop is what a lot of people think freeze is. Flop is dissociation, sleep, disconnection, detachment. It is when you consciously kind of cease to exist for a little bit. It's sort of the nervous system equivalent of turn it off and back on again. When you're in flop, there's no anxiety, there's no stress, there's no like adrenaline. It's the opposite of adrenaline. You feel empty. So there you have it. That's fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and flop. Oh, and like healthy nervous system activation. I forgot we also talked about that. So what do these things look like in a neurodivergent person though, especially someone who might have ADHD or autism? What are you doing? Oh, me? I'm working on a resource roundup for one of my one-on-one -on -one clients. What is a resource roundup? It's a really cool collection of Instagram accounts, academic articles, online tests they can take, uh, podcast episode, YouTube channels, and so many more resources that pertain specifically to what we've talked about in our sessions. That actually sounds really helpful. What do you put in a resource roundup? Well, for this particular client, we are primarily focusing on shame and stories we tell ourselves about who we are and how we can tell stories that are more helpful, more honest and more compassionate to ourselves. That's 
kind of awesome. Yeah, but I mean, for some of my clients, we focus a lot more on productivity. For other clients, we focus on emotional dysregulation. And for other clients, we focus on interpersonal relationships. It's super, super customizable when you work with me one-on-one. -on -one. So what should people do if they're watching right now and they want their own resource roundup? They wanna work with you. Oh, they can just go to the description and book a discovery call with me. I love meeting with people before I decide to work with them just to make sure we're a good fit. Oh yeah, 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 get back to work and, and we'll get back to the video. Oh yeah, thanks, okay. Well, healthy activation is going to look like stimming. Like 90% of the time, we tend to stim when we're activated, whether that's overly activated and we're into like fight, flight, freeze, all of that, or just healthy activation, which is why stimming is not always a sign of distress. It can be but it isn't automatically. As for flight, this could look like something called eloping. Eloping is a term for something a lot of autistic people do, which is where we run away very quickly without warning and we just go. Now there's lots of reasons an autistic person might elope. It doesn't have to be that their flight response is triggered. But one reason autistic people might elope is that their flight response is triggered. As for the fight response, that's gonna look like an external meltdown for most of us. Autistic meltdowns are a whole other conversation conversation and I promise to make a video about it soon. But just know that an autistic meltdown is really about a lack of control. It's about a loss of control. And it's when our feelings are turned up to 11. Our sensory perception is often turned up to 11 and we just don't know how to cope. And if you are triggered and the fight response comes out, that's gonna look like externalizing a lot of that distress. So it could look like yelling, slamming doors, uh, self-harm, hitting yourself in the head, things like that. As for freeze, I think this is going to look like an internal meltdown, which comes with the same amount of loss of control and like panic, but instead of processing that in an outward way with our behavior, uh, you're gonna process it internally through, you know, beating yourself up, yelling at yourself, calling yourself names, just a loss of control of your inner monologue, really. And the fawn response, of course, is masking. This is where you completely shut down who you are and you become who you think you have to be to survive. And flop is gonna look like dissociation, but it could also look like a verbal shutdown. So this used to be called like a non-verbal episode or a non-speaking episode. In fact, I have a video using that language, but um, a lot of the autistic community, especially the non-speaking autistic community has asked us to move away from those terms and reserve non-verbal, non-speaking for people who experience that on a more permanent or long-term basis. So if you experience short periods of not being able to speak or finding it really difficult to speak, um, that is now called a verbal shutdown. And maybe it's always been called a verbal shutdown and I was just using the wrong language for a long time. I'm not totally sure, but I know now, know better, do better. Verbal shutdowns often happen when autistic people are incredibly overwhelmed, but thanks to alexithymia, another thing I'm gonna make a video on soon, which is where you aren't always sure what it is you're feeling, we're not always sure why we're in a verbal shutdown, which can be really frustrating. So how can we cope? How can we shift some of these less helpful reactions toward the healthy stimulation? Don't you worry, I've got you covered with a bunch of really good tips that work specifically for my neurodivergent brain and hopefully it works for your neurodivergent brain as well. So if you're in fight mode, the number one thing I recommend, I recommend this to all of my clients, I recommend this so hard, please listen. Get ice cubes and I want you to chuck them with all of your force at the back patio, at the bathtub, wherever you can, just throw it so it shatters. Watching something break when you're in fight mode is like exactly what your brain wants. And ice is not something that's precious to you that you're gonna regret breaking later. It's not something precious to anybody else. It's not going to require a lot of cleanup because it just melts. It's really convenient, highly recommend. I also recommend whole body stims. So there are like, small stims like twirling your hair or jiggling your knee. I'm talking full body stimming. I want you to dance. I want you to jump. I want you to spin. Big body stims. This can really help with the fight response. And finally, if you're in fight mode, get in your car and scream. This is so satisfying. It makes you feel a little bananas, um, but that's okay. It's okay to be a little bananas because you're really activated. You are a little bananas right now and you're trying to be less bananas. And if it works, it works, right? If you are in flight mode, I really recommend pacing around your house. A lot of these you'll notice is about approximating what your body wants you to do. So like the fight response, we broke some stuff. 
we, we fought with the ice. With the flight response, we want to approximate flight. We want to approximate running away. So pacing can really help. Getting in your car and driving, you know, preferably remember your shoes if you can, but getting in your car and driving until you get lost and then turning on the GPS and saying, go home. I did that so many times over the years. As for freeze response, we actually want to do the opposite of what this response is telling us to do. Instead of freezing or approximating freezing, we want to do really small, gentle movements. So progressive muscle relaxation, which is basically where you just lie very still and you like progressively tighten and then relax various muscles throughout the body can be really good for this. Small stims can also be really good for this. So not the full body stims of the fight response, but just little stims, maybe rubbing your fingers together or a big one for me is rubbing the, my nails across my lips because they're so smooth and it feels good. Coping with the fawn response can be a little more difficult because in the moment, the only thing that feels safe is to comply, to acquiesce, to agree. And a lot of times you'll get the advice of, oh, just disagree, just stand up for yourself, just say what you mean. And it's just not that simple if you're in the fawn response. So here's what I recommend instead. I think you can ask questions. Sometimes asking questions, first of all, it deflects attention away from you and it gives you more information to help understand the situation better, which might make you feel safer. You can also find excuses to leave the situation. Even though you're not being drawn to flight, flight is sometimes a good way to get you out of the need to fawn. And when you're not actively in fawn response, you can talk to your loved ones about your fawn response, about your masking and how you would like to unmask and what that might look like for you. So far, everything we've talked about has been about bringing that activation down, right? But with flop, you actually want to activate yourself just a little. So here are some key ways you can do that. The first thing you can do is lie flat on your back on the floor, raise your hands above your head, close your eyes and take some nice deep breaths. Now, if you were in fight or flight, I would recommend that you take an inhale and then you exhale as slowly as you can. This is because a slow exhale is not really possible when you're in the middle of a fight or in the middle of running away. So when you slow exhale, it reminds your body, oh, we don't need to be in fight or flight mode. But if you're in flop, you kind of want to do the opposite. Take a deep breath and then sharply exhale quickly. Take a deep breath, sharply exhale quickly. And do that, don't do it so much you hyperventilate, but just a couple of times and it, it might help activate your nervous system just a little. Something else you can do if you're in flop is use heat. Heat is a wonderful way to bring the nervous system back online. So if you've got like a heating pad you can put on your stomach or your lower back, it first of all just feels good, uh, but also that can help bring your nervous system back online or you could just take a nice hot shower. So that's my overview of polyvagal theory for neurodivergent folks. Polyvagal theory is a wonderful way to explain why our bodies react the way they do when we feel rejected, hurt, or abandoned. I hope this video helped you understand polyvagal theory through a neurodivergent lens. And if you would like to do some polyvagal work with me as your coach, you can go ahead to the link in the description and book a discovery call with me where we can chat and figure out if I'm a good match to be your coach. I'm currently accepting one-on-one -on -one clients and I would really love to work with you. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time.